Now, you know, last week I uh, told you that I, I met face to face the Lord Jesus when I was a young boy and, 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 and that I fell to the floor and, and was powerless to get away from him. Um, you know, when I looked at him, I was scared. Um, I tried to run away and, until he told me um, to not be afraid. It seems that the Apostle John had the same experience as we saw in uh, Revelation 1, verse 17. And he says that when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. And after the service, someone came up to me and told me that they had had a similar experience um, to what I had when... Um, they were 36 years old. Not a Christian at the time, but he was after he encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? I believe that this reaction of, you know, fear of the Lord is quite a natural reaction, um, you know, that, that, that anyone will have uh, when they uh, see or if they see uh, the Lord Jesus in his present divine majestic form. That will be a normal reaction. Usually when Jesus was seen in his, you know, resurrected form by a person who saw him for the first time, uh, he would say something like, you know, don't fear or fear not or, or peace um, uh, to you and so on. Because the person's natural instinct was one of absolute awe and, and fearful reverence. And I think it, it does us good to just think of Jesus in that different light. You know, so many of us think of Jesus in his human form. We, we, we have images of him as a baby. We have images of him hang, hanging on the cross. And, you know, we have images of him around the Lord's table, as we've seen in, in pictures and so on. But I tell you what, these days we need to be looking at Jesus the way he is. And he doesn't look like that anymore. When we lay our eyes for real on him, it's a different story. When he tells John here not to fear, he's not only telling John, but he's also telling all of his followers since John. Because this is a word for the churches. It's a word um, for churches fearing the world and fearing the pressures of the world. And to us, he says, fear not. Unlike John, I don't remember Jesus saying anything else to me other than don't be afraid. I, I don't remember him touching me. Um, but fortunately for us, Jesus said a lot more to John than what he said to me in his vision. And today I want to focus on one thing he said that's very important. Let's go to verse 18 and 19. He said, I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and the grave. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. Here Jesus gives us the reason to not be afraid. And it wasn't just because of, of how he looked in his glorified state. So why else should we not fear? He declares to John and to us, I am the first and the last. He was there at the beginning of creation and he'll be there at the end in judgment. He was the first because before him there was no one else. And he's the last because after him there will be no one else. All things are from him and for him. When he says that he is the first and the last, we see an, an unlimited time of eternity that, that has no beginning and no end. And somewhere in that unlimited line of eternity is a tiny speck which represents our whole lifespan. Now, there was a time when Jesus chose to also be a speck on that eternal timeline when he was born into human flesh and then some 33 or so years later died. But of course, he didn't stay dead. He is now alive and he will be forevermore, he assures us. The other thing Jesus tells us is that he holds the keys to death and the grave. The NLT uses the word grave, while some other translations uh, says the keys to death and Hades. But you know what? They mean the same thing. 
And I want to spend a little time on this phrase, I have the keys to death and to the grave or, or to Hades, because that's, that's the phrase that kind of jumped up at me as I was um, preparing and studying for this message. When I was a young boy, we lived in an apartment for a while, uh, in a, an apartment building for a while, and, and one day my mom locked us out, and, and we had to get the superintendent to come and unlock the door for us. And I remember being very impressed when he, you know, when he showed up with this huge wad of keys, um, and, and I thought, wow, you know, he can go anywhere he wants to go. I guess even as a child I knew that, you know, having keys represents having authority uh, to unlock and open doors as well as to lock them. For example, if I were to give you the keys to my house, I would be giving you authority to go into my house. Whenever you wanted to enter the house, you'd simply just take the key and open the door. And by having keys to my house, you would also be able to let in whoever you wanted and lock out whoever you wanted. Well, praise God that Jesus is the key holder to the gates of death and Hades. And having them shows that he has the power to grant entrance or to grant exit from these two horrible enemies of mankind, death and Hades. The King James uses the word hell instead of Hades. But Jesus was not meaning the hell that we think of when we hear the word hell. And I know that many Christians are kind of a bit confused about this because of the different words used in the different translations. And so my hope is not to add um, to anyone's confusion, but that instead we might come away with a better understanding um, of the differences. In the New Testament, there are two Greek words which at times have been translated into the word hell. One is the word Hades, which is used here in verse 18, and the other is the word Gehenna um, that Jesus often used. Now, Gehenna is used for hell when describing a place of punishment. Gehenna is always used in connection with sinners. Hades, however, has quite another meaning to it. In the New Testament, the word Hades is used some 10 times, uh, depending on the translation. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word that was used to describe the same place as Hades was the word Sheol. Sheol, like Hades, is the place of the dead. In the Old Testament, all people went to Sheol. The wicked went to Sheol, and so did the righteous ones who loved God. When the Old Testament patriarchs died, they, they are described as you know, being gathered to their people. For example, when Jacob thought that his son Joseph had been killed, um, he refused to be comforted, as we see in Genesis 37, verse 35. Uh, all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. In this verse, um, some translations like the NLT and, and the King James use the word grave instead of Sheol. And the bottom line is that grave and Sheol and Hades all mean the same thing. They all mean the place of the dead. In other words, when you die, that's where you go. Nowhere in the Old Testament do we ever get the sense that the patriarchs or, or you know, any other members of God's people were going into the presence of God when they died. You just don't get that. Instead, they all expected to go down into the place of the dead, going down into Sheol. In the centuries immediately before Christ, um, after the Old Testament closed, many of the faithful came to believe that Sheol was divided into two separate places. One was called the bosom of Abraham, or, or what is also called paradise, and this is where the God-loving people went, where people who did their best to be righteous ended up. In the other part of Hades, or Sheol, was the place where the wicked, God-hating, and unrighteous people ended up. Jesus appears to give substance to this understanding of Hades when in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, he refers to Lazarus as being in Abraham's bosom and the rich man being in the place of the dead um, and saying that they were separated by a great chasm. 
Clearly, in the parable, we see that Lazarus was not in heaven, in the presence of God. He was in Abraham's bosom, or by Abraham's side, as some translations put it. And the rich man, who had refused to be merciful when he could have been, is seen as being in the other part, uh, or the other department of Hades, you know, close enough to be able to see Lazarus on the other side, but too far to jump the chasm separating them. Another thing that supports this idea is that when Jesus was dying on the cross, he says to the thief who had repented and asked him to be saved, um, he said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. And we often think of that, well, you know, that thief went straight to heaven. You know, people will say he never got baptized, he never did anything, he just went straight to heaven. But that's not where he went. You see, Jesus didn't say, you know, you will be with me in heaven today. The word heaven is found in, in, in the Bible some uh, 747 times. And, and Jesus used it in the Gospel of Matthew 67 times. And so why didn't he use it here? Well, because they would not end up in heaven that day. This paradise that Jesus and the thief went to that day could not possibly be heaven because we know that when Jesus died, he didn't go straight to heaven, he went to Hades. In fact, after his three days in Hades, his body was then resurrected and he then spent another 40 days on earth before ever going into heaven to be with his heavenly father. And so that Friday... When both Jesus and this thief died, they went to Hades, to that place known as the place of the dead, not to heaven. During the time between his death and his resurrection, that's where Jesus was. He was in Hades. Not in hell, as in the lake of fire, as some people have thought, Many people get confused about where Jesus went after his death because some translations have used that word hell, but the original word was Hades. The important thing is that Jesus didn't stay in Hades. Peter points out when he preached his first sermon um, you know, of Acts 2 that uh, God did not abandon Jesus um, in Hades. Peter was quoting, of course, the prophetic words of King David when he said in Acts 2, verse 31, he, speaking of King David, foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Of course, his flesh didn't see corruption, didn't see decay, because three days later he was raised and brought back to life. So no, Jesus was not left in Hades. And neither will anyone who has accepted the gift of salvation. A good question to ask about now is, why did Jesus have to go to Hades at all? And what was he doing? Um, what was he doing there those three days? Well, Peter tells us why uh, or what he was doing in 1 Peter 4 verse 6. That's why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So although they were destined to die like all people, they now live forever with God in the Spirit. And the reason that they're at this point living in the Spirit because they have not yet been resurrected. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> some, some scholars, of course, think that Jesus would have preached the good news to both the dead who had honored God uh, and also to those who didn't know God at all. They believed that the dead who had never heard the gospel while they were alive uh, would have heard it then directly from Jesus. And if they accepted the good news and worshipped Jesus, they would have been saved in Hades. I guess while the Bible is not clear on this, uh, it's a reasonable idea seeing how gracious God is. However, some other scholars think that Jesus only preached to the Old Testament believers. And I'll let you work out what seems true to you. Whatever the case is, we need to make sure that we don't end up stuck in Hades, and that's for sure. There's no purgatory where we get a second chance. And there's no getting out of Hades if you end up on the wrong side of it. If you end up in the wrong side of that great chasm away from Abraham's bosom, or, you know, call it paradise if you prefer. 
After Peter had the revelation that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus said this in Matthew 16, verse 18. And I tell you um, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now many people interpret this verse as saying that the devil can't win against the church. And while this is true, uh, it's not entirely what Jesus was meaning here. Certainly, Satan is involved in Hades because before Jesus um, did what he did on the cross for us, Satan was the gatekeeper. He had the power to keep those gates of Hades shut, keeping all sinners locked up in there because Satan had the power of death, as we see in Hebrews 2 verse 14. Because God's people are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. And what that means is that anyone who died without salvation, of course, ended up in this place called Hades forever until Judgment Day. Jesus changed that. And so when Jesus says that the gates of Hades shall not overcome or prevail against his church, he means that the gates of Hades can't keep believers locked away in death any longer because Satan's power of death has been broken. In this imagery, you know, the people of God are kind of like in Hades and they're waiting for someone to break the gates down and let them out. And so because Jesus now has the keys to those gates, everyone in Hades who accepted the gospel Jesus preached to them were then led out of Hades. Remember, Hades is the place of the dead for both the sinners in the sinner's quarters and for the dead believers who were in the paradise quarters. The reason the thief who died on the cross went to paradise with Jesus and not straight into heaven is because Jesus had not yet been glorified. He had not yet collected the keys to the gates of Hades. And so the saved thief had to go to Abraham's bosom first. He had to go to paradise first. Once Hades was emptied of God's Old Testament people, emptied of all of those who had accepted the gospel, preached to them by Jesus while he was there, these saved people were then led out of Hades. And, you know, that is not, not, not every scholar agrees with that. Some scholars think that, that, that every believer who dies is still in there waiting for the day of judgment. And then, of course, other scholars don't believe that. And so one thing we need to understand is as we go through this book, it is not clear in every area. Some things are just not clear, and, 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 and greater men than I have, have, have ended up with different opinions. And I, for one, am not going to pretend that I have the absolute answer to all of the puzzles that are presented to us. And so, you know, we have to be led by the Spirit, and we have to get our own convictions about what we feel is true or, or isn't. One thing is certain, if we get it wrong, it doesn't affect our salvation. You know? I mean, if you're saved, you're saved. Whether you think, um, you know, the rapture is going to be pre-tribulation or mid-tribulation or post-tribulation. I mean, if you're saved, you're saved. I'm all for pre because I don't like pain and suffering and, and all of that sort of stuff. So I'm going to believe that. Anyway. Um, sadly, you know, all of the dead... God haters and Jesus rejecters, they, they did not get out. And they will eventually be thrown into the lake of fire. You know, the true hell where Satan will also end up. And we know this from Revelations 20 verse 14 and 15 if we jump up ahead for a moment. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is really serious. You see, the first death is what got everybody into Hades. It is the place for all the dead. 
Before the cross, if you were one of God's people, you went uh, to the paradise part of Hades. If you were not one of God's people, then you went to the part you don't want to go. And sadly, you know, people are still going there every day. Those whose names is not recorded in the book of life will stay in Hades until the day of judgment when they will then experience the second death and be sent into the lake of fire. And so let me ask, is your name written in the book of life? Yeah? Some of you sure? Some of you not so sure? <laughs> I tell you what, if you're not sure, you better get sure. Because if, if, your, if your name is not written in that book of um, life, and, and I hope it's not just our name, because what if there's some other George Francos out there, you know? Like, hang on a minute. We want George Franco who was born here, there, on such a day and time. Just make sure you get it right. We used, we used to be the only Francos on the Gold Coast when we first arrived. Now there's a whole bunch of others. I don't know where they came from, but anyway, they're here. Anyway, if someone's name is not in that book, then they're going to go to Hades. And those gates of Hades will not be opened until it's time for the second death when Jesus will judge those who rejected his gift of salvation. There will be no second chances. After the first death, there's going to be no second chances. You know why? Because Jesus is not going back into Hades to preach the gospel again. It was fair and reasonable that he should go there because many people from the time of Adam had died not knowing that they could be saved. And so Jesus went and told them how. And that makes sense to me. But he's not going back there again. The world hates God because of his right to judge them for their sins. And the, and the world hates Christians just as much because of what we believe, and especially because we believe that in Jesus, we believe in what he says, and one of the things he says was concerning our final destinations. Jesus said that there's only two options, only two destinations. He said in Matthew 25, verse 46, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Amen. There's no in-between. It's words like this that make the world fume with anger. They hate the idea that their sin will cause them eternal death. And many simply refuse to believe that it ever will. But choosing to not believe the facts does not change the facts as countless people will one day come to realize. And so, you know, who are these people who will stay locked behind the gates of Hades and eventually will end up being thrown into eternal punishment? Well, if we jump up ahead a little bit, John tells us what Jesus said about who they are. Let's go to Revelations 21, 6 to 8. He said to me, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murders, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. How many people do we know who can be described like this in verse 8 and yet are rejecting God, are rejecting His gift of salvation, are rejecting His forgiveness? Countless. And so again here we see the second death mentioned. The first death takes us out of this planet and the second death takes us to our final destination, either to the lake of burning sulfur or to heaven. Have you ever smelt burning sulfur? Yes, right in the lobby. <laughs> Rotorua. Yeah, anyone who's been to Rotorua, man, that place stinks. <laughs> Even if it's not burning, sulfur smells terrible, you know? <laughs> anyway, don't shoot the messenger, okay? I, I didn't make this stuff up. If I could visualize the scenario that I think Scripture is presenting us with, 
it would, it would simply be this. You know, up until the time of Jesus, the souls of the faithful who had honored and believed in God didn't go into the presence of God when they died, but instead were sent to paradise or to Abraham's bosom. Um, they were faithful, but not perfect or sinless or even fully forgiven. However, when Jesus preached the gospel to them, they accepted it and then they became fully saved. When that happened, Jesus unlocked the gates of Hades and let them all out and released them into the presence of God in heaven. And as I say, that's a debatable point because not everyone agrees with that. As I said before, some think we're still there. Uh, not we, but you know, those who died before us. And so in effect, um, it's possible that he relocated uh, paradise from Hades up into heaven. And this is why St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8 that he would rather be away from this body so that he could be home with the Lord. And so because of that, uh, because of what Paul said in, in that context, some of the scholars believe that Christians will go straight to heaven when they die. And it sure sounds like that according to what Paul said. Some, however, do believe that we will stay in, in uh, paradise until the rapture when the dead in Christ will be resurrected and will join up with those who are still alive and together we all go to heaven. Some think that we will be in a deep sleep with no consciousness until we get resurrected and some don't know what to think. And so I'll let you work that out for yourselves. As we work through this book, you know, we're often going to come to parts that can be taken one way or the other. Remember, John is recording what he saw, not what was written. You know, and we, when we look at the things that he saw and put, our, put his shoes on, we can understand how hard it would have been to put into writing, to put into the words the things that he was seeing. And you've got to understand some of the things that he saw were to him impossible to happen at the time. In any case, with or without the book of Revelation, the gospel is still very clear and, you know, simple to understand. And, and I guess it could be summed up in one verse, which we all know very well, which is John 3.16, which says that for God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that, who, uh, you know, th that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Now, the meaning of that word believe, of course, is not just believe as in, yeah, I know he exists because I saw him, but it's more to put our trust in, to believe, to be uh, fully involved with. And so, of course, what this is really saying is that everyone who believes and treats him the way he should be treated. Because if we believe in Jesus, then we believe he's not just a man who came and was deluded and thought he could save us by dying on the cross and so he did that. No, if we believe in Jesus, we're believing in who he is and who he is today and always has been and that is our God, Lord and Savior. <coughs> and so no matter what we believe about, you know, first going to paradise or not, uh, what is really important is the statement that Jesus made about having the keys to death and Hades. Either way, if God's people end up there or for however long, they won't stay there because Jesus has the keys to open the gates and to let them out. In other words, the Lord is saying that by having the keys, I have power over what can imprison the body, which is death, and I have power over what can imprison the spirit, which is Hades. Death and Hades uh, uh, must yield before the power of Jesus Christ. Death can hold our bodies, Hades can hold our spirits, but Jesus holds the key to set people free from there. Amen? Amen. Jesus has robbed death of its sting. He's robbed Satan of his power, and he has robbed the grave of its victory. Hallelujah. Amen. Now this part of John's vision concludes with Jesus again telling John to write down everything he sees. He says in verse 19, write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. This verse 19 makes the book of Revelation continually relevant. It applies to us today even more than it did to the early church. Why? Well, because we are seeing many more things that John saw happening now than was happening in the early church back then. 
And going forward, folks, we're going to see in our lifetime many of the things that the book says will happen in the future. All through this book of Revelation, the past, the present, and the future will kind of overlap, overlap from time to time. For us, this book is much easier to understand and believe than it would have been for, the, you know, for poor John who was having to record some of those impossible things um, that he saw. And so unlike for the early church, the things that are happening now are much closer to the things that will be happening in the future. For us today, this book is totally believable. For the early church, much of this book would have seemed like fantasy pie in the sky. Can't possibly happen. How could it? But for us, no, that's not the case. We have the know-how. We have the technology to implement the trading restrictions referred to in this book as, uh, as, as what happens when you don't have the mark of the beast. The technology is already done. There's electronic tattoos that you can have put on any part of your body. And you know, my body is all covered except my face and my hands. So it makes sense that if you're going to put a mark on your body, you're going to put it on your hand or on your face somewhere. Otherwise, you know, okay, you want to check my mark here. Oh, no. So those things exist. You can have a, a, a pill, uh, you know, injected uh, just under your skin. And, and, and your, own, your own electricity and your own body can, can maintain the, the power of that thing. You can have electronic tattoos that can be read. It's there now. The technology is already here. But what would this have looked like to John? You know, the mark of the beast or, you know, not being able to buy or sell anything without it, you know? We, 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 we have evidence of what's happened just recently in, in, in our test trial of COVID. And how they stopped us from being able to go to the shops, how they stopped us from being able to visit one another, how they locked countries down all over the world. Countries that would never agree with each other, republics, democracies, socialist countries, communist countries, what, all on the same page for the first time in history? No, there's something else going on behind this. And so we are seeing things that John could never dream could happen, but we're seeing it already happening now. And therefore, we can look at what's going to be happening in the future and believe it. You know, we have the means and the weapons to see, you know, uh, great portions of the world, a third of the world going up in flames, as, as the book tells us is going to happen. Back in, in, in John's day, you would have thought, well, how could that possibly happen? Well, today, we know what we're going to be. So folks, we're there already. Yes. Nothing needs to be invented for everything that this book says is gonna happen, is gonna happen. And so for us, this book is totally believable because we are living in these last days for real. And, and I know that throughout history, the church has often said that we're living in the last days, but for us today, I think it's for real. Many Christians are very blasé about their relationship with the Lord. For, for them, obedience is optional. Serving God is optional. Attending church as we've been commanded to do is optional. Living a life that is so similar to people in the world that you can't tell the difference is optional. The grace of God covers everything. We can live the way we want because God's love and grace covers our by sentious living. I don't know where they get that idea, but many Christians believe that that's true. Well, folks, this book tells us that we can't afford to be like that. We can try to predict when the end will come by reading this book, by keeping a close eye on the world of ends. And, you know, we're given quite a few telltale signs to look for. Things like lots of false messiahs. Wars and rumors of wars, unprecedented earthquakes and famines, families betraying and turning on one another, the building of a new temple in Israel, and even the sun being darkened. You know, these are all signs that will tell us that the end is about to happen, 
and we can look out for them and get some kind of close idea of when things might happen. But you know what we're not given an idea about? About when the rapture of the church will happen. There's no warning about that. And let me close by reading a couple of verses that appear to be the only advice that we're given concerning when the rapture will happen. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. You know what unexpectedly means? It means when you're not expecting it. You know, you're sitting there, you're watching your favorite show on TV, you know, you've got your feet up, you're... You know, drinking your Milo or beer or whatever. And Jesus comes. That's unexpected. Jesus then tells us the only thing we can do while we're waiting for his unexpected return. He says this in Mark 13, verse 33. And since you don't know when that time will come, then be on your guard. Stay alert. What does stay alert mean to you? Yeah. Watch how you live. The signs indicating that we're close to this happening are too many to ignore, folks. We can't afford to take our relationship with the Lord for granted. We can be grateful that Jesus, who loves us, holds the keys to the gates of Hades and that He can make sure that we don't get locked up in there if that's where we still end up going after death. But we need to realize that we may not have the time to sort out what we know we need to sort out in our lives. We may not have the time that we think we have to get our lives in order and in line with God's will. Can I have my team up, please? You know, if the Holy Spirit ever convicts you of something, you know, never be too proud to, res- to, to not respond to Him. Never say to yourself, yeah, I should do something about that. I I, I will do something about that one day. Deal with it as soon as you're convicted. Because that's also when the grace of God is on you to deal with it properly. To deal with it with His help. Many people around the world will be thinking that they will end up at home in their usual bed tonight. But instead, with no warning, Many will end up on their deathbed this very day. You know, all around the world, countless people will die today and they won't expect it. Some will, they're sick, they've been told it's going to happen any day, and yet some of them will expect it, but the great majority will have no idea that today will be their last day before going to Hades. And I don't mean to scare anyone into action, but Jesus did say to stay alert and to expect his sudden, unexpected return. And so when he returns, which he will, and possibly soon, we want to all be packed up and ready to go. Amen? Amen, Amen indeed. Let me pray for you. Father God, we just thank you for this incredible book. Lord, it assures us that we need to not fear because you know how it all ends. And you've given us some indication in this incredible book, which, you know, we are struggling to understand, but Lord, we believe that by the end of it, the Holy Spirit will teach us what we need to know. In the meantime, Lord, give us the grace and the power to remain alert, to live the kind of life, Lord, where we have to make no adjustments when you show up unexpectedly like a thief in the night. That we will simply grab our travel bag and go. And not have to go around and sort things out, put things right with people, forgive who we haven't forgiven, seek forgiveness from those who need, whom we need forgiveness from, and, 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 and so on. Repent of sins that we've been committing, and all of that. Lord, we need to we need to be living in a way that we don't have to do any of that when you show up. So, Lord, help us to be those kind of people who are living day by day, ready to go. In Jesus' name we ask. And all of our people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.